Welcome to Audiencing Archaeology. In this lecture, we'll be looking a little bit at public archaeology and finding out the audience for archaeology and understanding what we are actually communicating about archaeology. So first off, what is public archaeology? This quote from Mortimer Wheeler sums it up fairly well. It is the duty of the archaeologist as of the scientist to reach and impress the public in the words of Mortimer Wheeler, it is the duty of the archaeologist, as of the scientist, to reach and impress the public and to mold his words in the common clay of its forthright understanding. Mortimer Wheeler was a long-time archaeologist, but also a very prominent public figure, a public intellectual, especially in the UK. He was on several television shows, as we found out earlier, and he really dedicated his life to bringing archaeology to as wide a public as he possibly could. From our selection of reading this week, from Gabe Moshenska's Public Archaeology, he really defines it as practice and scholarship where archaeology meets the world, and he intentionally describes it in a very, very broad manner. He provides this kind of matrix of public archaeology, trying to be as inclusive as possible. So going over, archaeologists, first off, working with the public. So this is community archaeology and heritage projects. So these are run by museums, universities, commercial units, all sorts. And this is where you have archaeologists reaching out and getting volunteers in, or more or ventures like dig ventures that directly draw on public funding or um, money from people to come and excavate. And then there's archaeology by the public. So these are archaeological societies and kind of controversial um, metal detector clubs. So these are the dedicated amateurs that are very interested in archaeology. Public sector archaeology. So this is work that's carried out on behalf of the national, regional, or local government. Um, archaeology education and so formal and formal learning about archaeology in the ancient world if right now you're having public archaeology i am um, doing some kind of educational outreach to inform you archaeological education so formal and informal learning and this is potentially what i'm doing right now i am doing public archaeology by in theory educating you about archaeology or school children learning through mock excavations, that sort of thing. Open archaeology, and so this is archaeological work that is made publicly accessible, and this can be anywhere from open days in an archaeological excavation to open lectures online or in person, or even increasingly making publications open access and openly readable to an interested public. Popular archaeology, this is definitely the television shows, museum exhibitions, books, magazines, etc. The ones that are focused on trying to bring their subject to a broad audience. Academic public archaeology, so going back to archaeological education. And so this is people who are dedicating their academic careers to understanding the impact of learning about archaeology in, on people. <clears throat> like Gabe Moshenska is very interested in this. And there are many people that incorporate some part of public understanding within their archaeological outreach and education. And I'll be going into this a little bit more in a minute. And there are many, many other types of um, public archaeology. And just to give you a kind of more concrete example, I will be using Chris Wakefield. This is Chris Wakefield. Chris Wakefield is a current PhD student here at York. And so as you see, he spent a long time, around a decade, a little bit longer, as an archeological um, excavator. So working in the field, excavating many sites. And so this is him excavating at the very famous Bronze Age site, Must Farm. But Chris Wakefield found that he had a real interest and a, an excitement and a real gift for public outreach as well. And so increasingly he was being involved in public outreach on sites and this could be this involved uh, giving lectures to school children and that sort of thing. 
And then again, on Must Farm, he leveraged this interest to get a position that was 50% archaeological excavation and 50% public outreach of all kinds. And so he was there for the open school days, he managed the social media, and he made uh, videos and really enhanced the reputation of the site, which was already a very a brilliant, very interesting um, site that was covered by many news outlets. But he was able to, he appeared on Blue Peter, for instance, and he made a Facebook page that um, had probably the most intense interest of a British archaeolo archaeological excavation that I've ever seen. Um, 22,000 people, if you see on this page, um, were liking and following Must Farm. And interestingly, they would update and interact with uh, the public on this, and so they would not only just um, put updates about the site, but then people could ask questions about the site, and Chris would endeavor to answer them. And he gave a public lecture online on Facebook just as the uh, pandemic shutdown started, and he had incredible interest, 12,000 views, um, with 700 comments that he really tried to go through and engage with everyone that was commenting and very interested in the site. And so he finally uh, was able to leverage this into a PhD that he's studying now. And so his PhD is the topic of trying to understand what social media actually is doing for public archaeology and what impact it is having on local and national communities and their understanding of archaeology. So there's a lot of opportunities in public archaeology. They, there are increasingly positions within archaeological units dedicated to outreach public archaeology, getting grants for this kind of outreach. Many units like York Archaeological Trust run things such as um, uh, Archaeology Live, which is all about public archaeology and taking volunteers on site. Museums and heritage jobs often have a component of public archaeology or at least public outreach and science communication. And this is directly translatable to media jobs often. So these skills you're learning through communicating archaeology in enables you to understand what it takes to create an image that is broadly accessible, create text that is also accessible, and really engage people in um, understanding archaeology and perhaps heritage or perhaps science more widely stated. And this also, if you can't really get away from public archaeology these days, uh, academic impact studies, the basis of our funding demands public outreach, and so they are increasingly measuring what kinds of impact we're having. Does our research actually change what the government thinks about archaeology? Does it change people's lives through understanding archaeology? Increasingly, they want us to evidence this through our research. And there's just a lot of transferable skills to be able to communicate things about the past or about pretty much anything is a highly desirable skill, especially when we're increasingly having to deliver content through visual and digital formats. And so you see, just if you want to get down to hard numbers, this is from 2018, the state of the archaeological market. You see down at the bottom, um, other research in public archaeology and community projects and the Heritage Lottery Fund. But you combine those two together, and they move up the list um, considerably in what we are getting our money from and what the um, demand is for these skills and for this within our within our sector. So then we get into so who exactly is the audience for archaeology? This is from 2014 when YouGov did a profile on archaeology or people who are all interested in archaeology. And as you look at this readout, you see that people tend to be older. Um, interestingly, it says the gender skews female, but they chose to make a profile, profile of a man. And the politics are generally rightist. Now see again demographics, the gender is male, age 60 plus, um, 
top region in Wales, tend to be a little bit on the right of the spectrum um, of politics and do not have a lot of monthly spare income. And so there's some really interesting other data. You see their sample size is over 10,000 people. They most likely might have a cat. They have other niche interests in collecting things, bird watching, model building, um, science, and sailing, apparently. And this is a very broad sto strokes understanding, but most people tend to think, oh, if you're interested in archaeology, you must be a lot like myself. You must be young and just entering uni, and so you tend to, to pitch your public outreach at that. But you have to really think, so what demographic am I trying to reach here? Am I trying to reach very young children? Am I trying to reach teenagers or um, women from 30 to 60? So really defining who you're trying to reach through your outreach and through your visual and digital interpretations is really important. And you think about, okay, so what then do we communicate to our selected audience? And um, so things we communicate things about the past, including the contemporary past. So um, these are the broader questions of archaeology. I drew these from the grand challenges for archaeology as published. And things like, how do humans respond to environmental change? Why and how do social inequalities emerge, grow, persist, diminish, and with what consequences? That's very much Penny Bickle's research, if you're interested in the department. Um, and so how do people form identities? And then we can also communicate about how archaeology is performed. So how is archaeology different than history? How is archaeological research performed? Who can become an archaeologist? And this one is really key in most depictions of archaeologists, as we've seen through all of our other media critique, is very much that older, white-bearded man. And so how can, should we change the idea of who performs archaeology? Is changing the idea of who performs archaeology, would that help us reach a broader demographic? Or would that draw in different people who might give different perspectives on archaeology and the past? And how can learning about the past help us understand current problems? But overall, kind of at the heart of it, we have to think, so why, why is archaeology important? And that really should be a very central question of any research that you do within this program. Why is this research important? How can I com communicate the importance of this research and to whom?